You can stand with me today. We're in John chapter 17. If you need a Bible, go ahead and raise your hand. John chapter 17, get your hand up high. If you need a Bible, our ushers would be happy to stick the word of God in your hand. John 17, this is the longest recorded prayer of Jesus that we have in the scriptures. Uh, I'm going to read this whole chapter to us because it's worth it. All right. The Bible says, when Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son that the son may glorify you since you've given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life. Just, you know, just in case you were wondering what eternal life is, Jesus describes it here. And this is eternal life that they know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I glorified you on earth having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. I've manifested your name to the people whom you gave to me out of the world. Yours they were, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything that you have given me is from you. For I've given them the words that you gave me, and they have received them, And have come to know in truth that I came from you. And they have believed that you sent me. I'm praying for them. I'm not praying for the world. We'll we'll explain that in just a minute. But for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. All mine are yours and yours are mine and I'm glorified in them. I'm no longer in the world, but they are in the world. And I'm coming to you, Holy Father, keep them in your name, which you have given me, that they may be one even as we are one. While I was with them, I kept them in your name, which you've given me. I've guarded them, and not one of them has been lost except the son of destruction, that the scripture might be fulfilled. But now I'm coming to you, and these things I speak in the world that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I've given them your word and the world has hated them because they're not of the world just as I'm not of the world. I do not ask that you take them out of the world. I was a little bummed about that phrase right there, but we'll talk about that in a second too. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They're not of the world just as I'm not of the world. Sanctify them in your truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sake, I consecrate myself that they also may be sanctified in the truth. I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. Who's that? That's us. That they may all be one just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you've given me, I've given to them, that they may be one even as we are one. I in them and you in me, that they may become perfectly one so that the world may know that you sent me and love them even as you loved me. Father, I desire that they also whom you've given me may be with me where I am to see my glory that you have given me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, even though the world does not know you, I know you, and these know that you have sent me. I made known to them your name, and I will continue to make it known that the love with which you have loved me may be in them, and I in them. Uh, that's good, isn't it? Mm. Let's pray. Father, thank you. God, thank you for this divine disclosure. God, thank you for this opportunity to peek into the prayer life of Christ, your son. Thank you for this petition that is just so, it's so robust God, there's so much vibrancy to this request. 
God, these petitions, there's so much purpose. Father, thank you that you've been answering this prayer of Christ for 2,000 years. And God, we pray today that, that we would hear, God, we would hear you speak to us through the prayer of your son. And God, that we would align ourselves, that we would submit ourselves, that we would surrender ourselves. God, as you bring the spirit of revelation to us today and cause the light to go on. God, it supply the strength that we need to lean into your divine purposes. And God, to not miss out in this moment of time all that you have for awakened Las Vegas. God, we pray today, move in this house. In Jesus' name, amen. You can have a seat. I mean, I read this and I think it's a legitimate question to ask, why would God give us a peek into this private prayer of Jesus? Why would God give us this opportunity to have some insight into what otherwise would be a very private moment? You know, you know how your prayer life is. It's, a, it's typically, of course, I mean, we pray in public, there's no doubt about it, but, but those moments, those deeply private moments where it's just you and the Father, you know, there's something special and intimate about the enclosure of that communication between you and God. And I think that that certainly was true for the Son, but this prayer, this prayer is different. Like if you do do a study on the prayers of Jesus in the Bible, what you'll notice is that what we're left with are fragments of prayers. Like moments where you know that there was a lot more that was shared in the prayer, but you just get a piece of what was prayed. In the Garden of Gethsemane, you remember um, that he said, he prayed three times, Father, if there's any way, let this cup pass from me, but nevertheless, not my will be done, your will be done. And yet we know that there was an evening, there were hours that were spent in prayer and there was so much more, but we were given just a fragment. Or there are staccato prayers of Christ, you know, where it's just an intentionally short prayer that's sent to the heart of the Father that we're given exposure to because it had a particular purpose. He's standing before the tomb of Lazarus and you know he's praying to the Father and he's, he says it. He says, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm praying on purpose so that those around me can hear this prayer. We, we think about the blessing of the, of the little loaves and the fish that were brought by that young boy and placed in the hands of Jesus as he lifted his eyes to heaven as, as he blessed them. And yet, you know, we're just left. We're left with fragments or staccato prayers and yet, and yet this is the prayer. This is the prayer that the Father chooses to disclose to you and to me. And I wonder, I want, like I'm sure you've asked that question as well, as we have this prayer laid out before us. Like why was it that he chose this prayer to be the prayer? If, if you look at verse 13, Jesus actually prays this to the Father. He says, but now I'm coming to you, and these things I speak in the world that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. And so in the prayer, in the prayer while the disciples are listening, you know, he actually says to the Father, I'm speaking these things out loud because part of the product of this prayer is going to be that my joy is experienced in the lives of disciples to come. And so, you know, I think it is a legitimate question. What about this? What is it about this prayer that brings joy to the heart of a believer? Um, no doubt, just very, just off the top, what brings us joy is knowing that Jesus prays for us, right? I mean, that I'm sure as the disciples were listening, there was this sense of relief. There was this sense of peace. There was this sense of, you know what? Thank you, Father, that the Son is praying for me because sometimes my prayer life is miserable, Right? Sometimes my prayer life is anemic. Sometimes my prayer life is shallow. Sometimes my prayer life just hits a wall and I don't know what else to pray. And it's in those moments where we can just take great peace in knowing that the, the interceder, you know, he's the interceder. The Bible says that he's ascended to the right hand of the Father and he always lives to make intercession for those who come to faith in him. Like he's at the right hand of the Father and he's able to because he's omniscient. He can do this. He can intercede on behalf of every single one of us. And there better be a sense of peace in your heart because of that. You know, you, you might be sitting here today thinking, man, I, I don't got anybody. I got nobody. No one prays for me, man. You know, this church, no one's asked how I'm doing or no one's asked how I feel and 
There's no one who wants to bear my need before God. And, and, and listen, this, this should be a house of prayer. and We better be praying for one another. But in those moments you feel that way, I want to encourage you, fall back on the fact that the Son of God himself is standing between you and the Father, and he's bringing your need, right? He's bringing your need. And, and I don't know what your need is today, which is so great when you're praying for people. You don't have to know because the Son knows. Like you got a money issue, you got a relationship issue, you got a sin issue, you got a guidance issue in your life, things are obscure, there's a cloud hanging over your head. Well, the Son knows all of that. And he's able to strategically intercede on your behalf and bring that prayer to the Father. I'm sure that that was relieving to them, and I pray it's relieving to you today. But there's something, there's something more to this prayer than that. I call this the revelation prayer. Some people call it the high priestly prayer. I'll explain to you in a minute while that's not necessarily my, my favorite handle for this prayer. I call this the revelation prayer. I think it is the clearest picture of the eternal purpose of the Trinity for the church outside of the epistles. I think when you read this prayer, what you discover is an, is it an unfolding of the eternal purpose of the triune Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit for the people of God. And I will tell you, man, I, I've sp I spent years reading this prayer and, and, you know, there were fragments that blessed me, um, but I never really fully understood the full content of what it was that Christ was trying to convey through this prayer. And so I wanted to I wanted to kind of consolidate for you what I really believe is at the heart of this prayer. This prayer unfolds God's plan to reveal himself by sending his eternal son into the world to redeem humanity and creation broken by sin through a personal and eternal relationship with Jesus, forming a kept, sanctified, united, loved, and ever-expanding community of followers, all who share his mission being sent into the world to proclaim Christ to the lost for their joy and the glory of the Father and of the Son. That's a lot, isn't it? It's a lot. It's a lot. It's a lot. And since it's a lot, I'm going to read it again to you guys. And, and I really want you to key in on the last part. This prayer unfolds God's plan to reveal himself by sending his eternal son into the world to redeem humanity and creation broken by sin through a personal and eternal relationship with Jesus. By the way, the only way you can have a relationship with God the Father is exclusively through trust and faith in his Son, okay? Forming a kept, sanctified, united, loved, and ever-expanding community of followers, all who share his mission, being sent into the world to proclaim Christ to the lost for their joy and the glory of the Father and the Son. I think, listen, I love, one of the reasons I love this prayer is it is an anchor for us. It's an anchor for us. It's a needed anchor as we consider all of the iterations of Christianity over the generations. I just got back from Israel. We had a great time. It was, it was amazing. Um, good to see the family that was with us here on this trip. God does something special in our relationships when we spend two weeks in Israel together and on the bus together for a long time. But if you're in the old city, if you're in the old city and you know, you're just paying attention, what you see is this. You see, you see Orthodox Christianity, you see Catholics, Armenians, Baptists, Calvary Chapel people. You see, <laughs> amen, you see church traditions, you see relics and icons and incense, you see cultural influences on the church across the generations. And on this particular trip, for me, as I'm like looking at all of this, and I'm not saying that any of that is wrong because every generation has a unique aspect of expression with respect to Christianity, okay? But, but this particular trip, it just made me pause and think, Jesus, when you walk the earth, what was it that you had in mind for your church, right? I mean, when you walk the earth, what was it that you purposed? What was your plan? Because I look at all of this and I see so many different iterations, so many different things. And sometimes, you know, in the diversity of iteration, we can lose the mission and the purpose that he has divinely, eternally intended for his people. And I'm thinking, what is it? 
What is it that you desire? What is it that you want? Because, because I want to make sure I'm on that mission. And I think that this prayer, I think it anchors us. And I think that it's a needed prayer because you know Jesus is the most hijacked figure in world history. He is the most hijacked figure in world history. Millions co-opt him for their agenda. Today, I think, you know, some people reduce Jesus to a role model to follow. I'm not saying that he's not, but some people would say that's all he is. Some people say he's a religious good to be consumed. Some people say he's the ultimate selfless lifestyle to emulate. And by the way, he is, but he's more than that. Some people say he's the purveyor of principles and policies that empower institutional authority. And we see that in churches today. Some people say he's a good luck charm. Some people think he's a divine therapist. Some people think he's an icon for revolution. And I think, you know, he is so much more than all of that. And this prayer is a powerful petition at the apex of his ministry as he inaugurated God's kingdom and empowered his disciples to carry his mission forward. This prayer has been empowering God's people for 2,000 years to fulfill the mission of God. Did you know God's on a mission? Did you guys know that? You know he's on a mission. You know it's because God is on a mission, we are on a mission too. Theo- theologians, I have no idea what that is. If you can Google that for me, tell me later. Theologians have called the mission of God missio dei. Do you know what missio dei means? Missio dei is a Latin phrase that means mission of God. This is what theologians do. It's like, can't you just use the language that we speak? No, they, they, they say it in Latin to make it sound super sophisticated. But the mission of God, missio dei, is this. God is on a rescue mission to renew a lost humanity, a fallen creation, a goal that he faithfully brings to pass through Christ and his church. That's right, that's right. And you know what? He does it relentlessly. He does it relentlessly. God has been on mission relentlessly for 2,000 years. And why is the mission of God important for us to consider? Because you know what the church oftentimes does. The church creates its own mission and then asks God to configure himself to our mission. And that's why, that's why Missio Dei is so important. No, listen, what, what is God's mission? And then, you know, let's configure ourselves. Let's configure our church. Let's configure our programs. Let's configure our lives. Let's configure our giving. Let's shape everything to God's mission so that what we're doing, we know, is hitting the target that God intended. If the great, I'll pause there. If the Great Commission, and you know the Great Commission, go into all the world and make disciples of all nations. If the Great Commission is the command to continue God's mission, this revelation prayer paints the picture of God's plan and the purpose that his people serve. I think the key word in this prayer is, yeah, you guys are good, man. First, con- first service got it too. I was surprised because you know they're a little slower than the 11 o'clock. No, I'm, I'm messing. I'm playing. I'm playing. I'm playing. Look, I think, and I, I do think this. I, you, you guys know I read a lot of commentaries. I understand what the theologians think. And for some reason, it seems to me that this key word is missed in their understanding and explanation of this prayer. The word sent appears six times. It refers to the Father sending the Son and to the Son sending his disciples. And the argument sometimes goes something like this. Well, no, it's not really about sent, being sent, or the mission of God. This prayer is for us, pastor. This is the prayer that he prayed for his people. This is all about us and our experience and the the vibrancy of our spiritual life. And those people would argue, they would say, hey, listen, it's about our eternal life. It's about how he keeps us and sanctifies us and unifies us and loves us. And I say, you know what? That's true, but there's more to it than that. Jesus prays for the vibrant spiritual life of his followers so that they could be an effective witness to reach the lost. Like what you're gonna notice, what you're gonna notice is he lifts up these petitions to the Father These petitions and prayer to the Father. Father, keep them. Father, sanctify them. Father, unify them. Father, love them. 
It's all in the framework of us being witnesses for his glory. It's all within the framework of us being sent. I'm going to let you decide for yourself, but what you're going to see with respect to all those aspects of the vibrant life of the Christian is that Jesus in his prayer connects it to the mission of God. So, for instance, we see right off the bat, maybe the most important verse in this prayer is verse 3, where he says, and this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God in Jesus Christ, whom you've sent. What is eternal life? What is eternal life? Well, according to Jesus, it's not just some distant, faraway place that you go to when you die, where there's clouds and harps and an everlasting supply of sushi for the marriage supper of the lamb, right? I mean, and you know, sometimes people reduce it, they reduce eternal life to that. But that's not the way he describes it. The way he describes it is like this. It's a real and everlasting relationship with God that began the moment you trusted in Christ. A life that God intends for you to share with others. A life that God intends for you to share with others. Your relationship with God is, and if you agree with this, you say amen. Your relationship, I haven't said it yet, so (laughs) just a minute. You're like, I don't care what it is. Amen, pastor. I love (laughs) I love that type of person, okay? <laughs> hey, your relationship with him is intimate. Yes. Amen. <laughs> your relationship with him is personal. Yes. But your relationship with him is also shareable. Yes. It's shareable. It's not just personal. It's not just intimate. It's not just for you. It's for others. You know, when you go to a restaurant um, you know, after a service, not today because you're going to come back for the family service and we have canes for you today, not sushi, sorry about that, but, but we'll have lunch together. But when you go to a restaurant, you know, you sit down, you're like, hey, well, I'm going to get some appetizers. I'm going to get some shareables. And the shareables come and, you know, they're not just for you, they're for other people as well. The eternal life that God has blessed you with is not just for you, it's for others as well. When I gave my life to Christ, I couldn't stop talking about Jesus, I mean, I'd just gotten out of jail. Uh, I'd just gotten out of jail. He, he received me in the midst of my sin and my decadence and, my, and, and the nasty heart I had towards Christians and Christianity. I came in my brokenness and my need, and he accepted me graciously just as I was. And you know... And you know, in that spot, I'm like, I don't care. I don't care if you're old. I don't care if you're young. I don't care if you're a tree, a plant, a dog, or a cat. I'm sharing Jesus with you. It was like, it was like if you stood in front of me, you got, you got like the, the fire hose of the gospel. And, and there were people who were like, hey, whoa, whoa, Derek. You know, whoa, whoa, don't you know faith is meant to be kept in the private world? And that's not true. That's not the intention of God. God didn't just bless you so you could be blessed. God blessed you so that he could bless other people through your life, right? John chapter 17, verse 2, to give eternal life to all, check these words out, to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. And he'll go on to pray for all those who would come to believe through the words of the disciples. It is through the words of the disciples. Listen, it's through your sharing, your living, but also your sharing that other people come to faith in Christ. I think about the word kept. It's a powerful word in this prayer as well. It is a powerful principle in the life of the Christian. To be kept means that God's preserving power is at work in our life in such a way that he sustains us, he protects us, he guards us, and he keeps us, no matter what. Like, no matter what, you are in, let me tell you something, brothers and sisters, you are in the hand of God. If you believed in Jesus Christ, you are in the hand of God. Man, that's a good thing. And, and, you know, for some of us, you're like, man, my life is so topsy-turvy and the waves are crashing against the ship and everything to, seems to be chaotic. Well, I've got good news for you. You're in the mighty hand of the almighty creator of the universe, right? 
Gio's hanging out up here. He's one of our security guys. If you shake Gio's hand, I'll tell you right now, you will hear the bones breaking, right? You shake his hand and it's like, like, am I supposed to say mercy? Because mercy, man, mercy. Dude, I hear, I, I hear my bones popping. And as strong as his handshake is, is nothing compared to the strength of the hand of God in your life. Right? This is what Jesus says. Jesus is speaking to his disciples about how they all who have believed are in the hand of the Father, and no one is able to snatch them out of the hand of the Father. Paul said it like this. He said, I'm convinced that nothing can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Absolutely nothing. Nothing. Like we live fearlessly. We live fearlessly. We fear God, and because we've trusted in him and are in his his hand, secure in his hand, we can live our lives without fear in this world. Right? He keeps us while we are kept in this world. He keeps us while he has chosen to keep us in this world. And he keeps us so that while we're in this world, we can radiate his glory to our neighbors, to our colleagues at work, and to strangers that we meet. Oh, this is the way he says it, John chapter 17, verse 11, and also verse 15. He says, I'm no longer in the world, but they are in the world. Like, you got to catch that, right? Essentially, what he's praying to the Father is, I'm ascending. My physical presence won't be there. It'll be at the right hand. Instead of my physical presence being in the world, it will be the people of God whom I'm living through, the body of Christ. He's chosen to keep us in this world on his behalf as the tool that he uses to demonstrate the glory of the Father through I'm no longer in the world. They are in the world. I'm coming to you. Holy Father, keep them in your name, which you've given me, that they may be one, even as we are one. I do not ask that you take them out of this world, but that you keep them from the evil one. Now, honestly, I'm like, man, would it, it would have been so cool if when you and I put our trust and faith in Jesus Christ, boom, personal rapture, personal rapture, like translated into the presence of God, You know, that our invitations would work something like this. You know, I'll lead you in prayer. You put your faith in Christ. You come forward. And then, boom, you're just in the presence of God. And, And I think sometimes, sometimes what happens as we're in this world, you know, we lose sight of God's mission. We get so angry at the world. We are so sick of the sin of the world. We're so desperate to escape. Like, we really do want Jesus to come back but it's less for his glory and more about our personal escapism. And and the danger, listen, brothers and sisters, the danger is in this, like when we're so angry at the world and we're sick of the sin in the world and we're like, Jesus, come back because I want out. You will miss the purpose for why he has chosen not to take you. Look, you're here, you're living, you're breathing. Some of you are sleeping. (laughs) Your heart is beating, you're not dead yet. You're not dead yet. You're like, duh, that's obvious. It's like, did you go to, did you go to Bible college to learn that? No, I, I'm telling you today, because he hasn't chosen to take you, you are present for a purpose. You're present for a purpose. Stop being so... so stop being so consumed with your anger and your disappointment and your sense of escapism, and start locking into the reason why he has chosen to keep you here in the first place, all right? Kept, kept, kept is connected to sent. Sanctified, what about sanctified? Remember, the word sanctify means to be continuously formed into the image of Jesus Christ. It means to be continuously formed into the image of Jesus Christ, check this out, because most people put a period after Jesus and they forget the purpose and to radiate his image to the world, to radiate his image to the world. So he forms us and shapes us into the image of his son so that we can radiate that image to the world. This is what he says in verse 17 of this prayer. He says, sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. But it doesn't end there. Verse 18, as you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. 
And for their sake, I consecrate myself that they also may be sanctified in truth. So what he does here is he expresses the purpose of the Father to shape every believer into the image of his Son for the purpose of sending, for the purpose of sending. You know, God is, God is sanctifying you. How does God sanctify us? Well, the Bible says, according to Jesus, that God sanctifies us by the Holy Scriptures, by his word of truth, like a doctor uses a scalpel, um, or more modern terminology, a doctor uses a laser. Strategic, uh, very precise, accomplishes his purpose. Well, the Father is doing the same thing. Every time you open the book, every time you open the book with an open heart, every time you open the book with an open heart and open ears to hear what it is that God has to say to you, what God does because his word is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, that word which never returns void, but is living and active, works in your heart. It's shaping you and changing you. And then you know what God does? He takes the circumstances that you're going through and like a master potter, he brings those things together to make you look more like Jesus. That's what God's doing. God does that when you're on the mountaintop and God does that when you're in the valley. God does that in your life when it's the high times and God does that in your life when it's the low times. Because I guarantee you that someone's here thinking this, Pastor, my life is, I'm a Christian and my life is a mess. I'm going through so much adversity and difficulty and the, the ship feels like it's sinking. I almost feel abandoned by God. How could God use anything like this? And I want to tell you, he can because he's God. He can because he's God. Because you're in the hands of the master potter. And the master potter can take the most miserable, seemingly meaningless circumstances of your life and he can use them for good because he has a purpose and he has a plan. He has begotten you again to a living hope through Jesus Christ, his son. And you don't see it right now. You can't see it right now. You're like, man, there's no light at the end of the tunnel, God. I don't know what you're doing here. Well, you may not know what he's doing through you, but I'll tell you what, he's doing something in you. He's pruning right? He's shaping. He's shaping. He's addressing those areas of idolatry that we have that we don't even know that they're idolatrous. He's addressing the affections that still exist within our heart for things that, that aren't pleasing to him or in our best interest. And often it's through the crucible of, of affliction and difficulty that he causes those things to come to light, not to hurt us, but to make us look more like his son. And he does that so that we collectively together are a contrast community. We're a kingdom community. Like we're a different community, church. You understand that? That the church, church, is different from any other social organization in the world. We're a kingdom community. We're, we're people, as we yield ourselves to the master potter and let him shape us as you say yes to that, as Arturo says yes to that, right? Arturo? Amen. <laughs> as Stephanie says yes to that, as Stephen says yes to that, right? As, as we're in that place where it's like, God, here am I. Shape me and change me and conform me into the image of Christ. As we all do that together, this church becomes something powerful in the hands of God. Like we are a contrast community, we're a kingdom community, we're a kingdom of priests, we're a royal nation, we're set aside for divine purposes, we're a city set on a hill, we're a bright shining light. Like we don't look like the world on purpose because what we are is a picture of what God had intended for humanity all along. And therefore we are like an invitation to, a, to the world that so desperately needs the belonging that's found in the body of Christ. Sanctified, sanctified to be sent, unified. Maybe unity is the biggest thing that emerges from this prayer and it's most typically what pastors talk about. Remember when I say unified, I'm not saying that we all belong to the same church. I'm not saying that we all wear Christian t-shirts. I'm not saying that we all speak the same weird language because you know we've got some really weird language. 
I'm saying that as believers, we've been baptized by God's spirit into Christ's community. When I'm in Israel and I'm hanging with my Israeli friends and we're talking about Christians, um, this is what they say. They'll say, oh yeah, she belongs to the community. Or they'll say, he belongs to the community. And what they've done is they've identified Christians as a community of people, a community of people that believe the same thing but are united together. And I love that. It's a great reminder, right? We are, we are one community. There may be many churches in the city of Las Vegas, but fundamentally, we are all one in Christ. Ephesians chapter four, Paul says it like this, there is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all, through all, and in all. I love that, right? That's the unity that we have. There is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all, through all, and, and in, he says, and in, and in y'all, and in y'all, and I, I'm saying, you're like, well, wait a minute, man, I don't see, where, where is that unity? Well, let me just tell you something, this is what he died for, this is what he died for. He died to create that in our lives, he died to create a community that we're born into when we put our trust and faith in him. That exists. That is. That is undeniable. Now, the question is this. Are we living to that? Are we living to the unity that Christ himself died for us to experience? And why did he create this unity in the first place? Well, the Bible says in verse 20 in this prayer Jesus says, I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one. Just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us. Why? Why? Look, read the next phrase. You tell me why. Oh, it's right there. You guys can read it out loud. <laughs> so that the world may believe that you have sent me, right? The purpose of of the unity within the body of Christ is intended to be a light to the lost world. The oneness that we share with each other is something that expresses the relationship between the triune Godhead. I, I think about you know, the way Jesus describes this. He's like, you give them the same unity, Father. Give them the same unity that we have with one another and so what picture does Jesus use to express the unity that should be existing within the church? He uses the picture of the Trinity. And last time I looked, there's no schism in the Trinity. Last time I looked, there, were, there, there was no agenda in the Trinity, like the Father saying to the Spirit, hey, you know, Jesus, his britches, he's a little too big for his britches. And, you know, we need to work out our own plan because, you know what, he's just like magnified himself beyond us. No, there, there's no... There's no agenda. There's no ulterior motive. There's no gossip among the Trinity. You know, Jesus gossiping about the Father to the Holy Spirit. You know, can you believe what he did? And I, I don't like it either, right? I don't like it either. And I say that, and you're like, man, pastor, that's, that's just absurd. And I say, no, it's not, because that's the unity we're supposed to be living to. We're supposed to be living to that. If there's no schism in the Trinity, there should be no schism in the body of Christ. If there's... If, if there's no ulterior agenda that we're after, if, if there's, you know, within the, within the Trinity, there shouldn't be one in the body of Christ. If there's no gossiping, if there's no murmuring, if there's no backbiting, if there's no sense of like putting other people down so we can lift ourselves up, if that's the truth in the Trinity, it should be the truth in the church as well. And let me just say something to you very personally. As a pastor, disunity in the church is the most difficult thing to deal with. I'm not complaining. I, I'm not complaining. I'm just telling you. I'm telling you. It is the hardest thing to deal with because you know the devil doesn't have to just create pressure from the outside to mess up the church. He can create division from within. He can create division from within. And you know what? This thing I'm going to say to you, it should scare the hell out of you. And I mean literally. Literally. Right, that the devil can actually use Christians who have lost sight of the mission of God to thwart the purpose and plan that God has for a local church. I mean, that's scary. 
That's scary when we get so engrossed in ourselves and our purpose and our agenda. And you know, we start little factions and schisms. And you know, we're, we're thinking about, about ourselves. And we're thinking about what our mission is. And if I was in charge, this is how I would do it. And all of that begins to break down the purpose of God for any local church because you know God has dreams for this church. God has dreams for this church. God has a plan for this church. And it's exceedingly abundantly above all that we could ever ask or think, right? But, but the greatest threat to the purpose that God intends for this church is division within the body of Christ. That's why what we have to do is humble ourselves and yield ourselves to the mission of God. Doesn't mean we have to like everything. Doesn't mean we have to agree with everything. But it does mean that love covers a multitude of sins. It, it does mean that we recognize when there is sin and gossip and, and murmuring, almost said murdering, that would be bad too. <laughs> <laughs> and murmuring, and, and, and we're wise enough and mature enough. Man, I don't want to harp on this too long, but I'll tell you, I'll tell you that people that have walked with the Lord for 30 years should know better. 25 years, 20 years, for goodness sakes. You know, let's grow up. Let's grow up and say, you know what, God, I'm on your mission. This is my church. I'm on your mission. And so, so I'm going to help preserve the unity of the body of Christ so that we hit your target. Amen? Amen. The final thing today, thanks for your patience, is this. It's, it's love. So he's praying, keep them, sanctify them, unify them, and love them. It's the self giving love of God. You say, what's that like? Well, this is what he says. Love, love, you've loved them as you've loved me. Now, look, I don't have time to unpack that, but you better think about it. Love them. You have loved them as you loved me. You are loved by the Father as the Father has loved the Son. Now, listen, the world is broken because people are living without God's love. The world around us is broken you say, why, are, why is everyone so messed up? But they're living without the love of God. And so he says this says in this prayer, I and them and you and me that they may become perfectly one so that the world may know that you sent me and loved them even as you have loved me, right? He's loved us with the same love that he's loved the son with so that as we love one another, overflowing with the love of the Father, loving one another, the world can see that what we believe about Jesus is true. Jesus was sent by the Father. You know, 1.8 billion Muslims just this last Thursday began to observe Ramadan, which is a, a month-long time of praying and fasting. It's one of the pillars of Islam. And you know what we ought to be doing? We ought to be praying over the next 30 days that every one of those Muslims understand and know the depth of God's love through faith in the Son. Through faith in the Son. Because what they're missing is the love of God. And I think about our own culture. We see racial division and violence and social confusion and broken families People confused about their sexual identity and their gender. And the fact is this, all of that exists because hearts need the love of God. And you say, and you say, well, well, why isn't God doing that? Well, God has chosen to love the lost world through his church. The love that comes through the church is supposed to be a magnet to the lost. It is supposed to be pulling lost people in because they're seeing something in the people of God they've never seen anywhere else. And it's, it's otherworldly, it's supernatural, it is selfless, and it finds its source in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I'm saying to you today that in these petitions, what he said is to the Father, keep them and sanctify them and unite them and love them so that the world may know so that the world may know. The question is this, will you live as an answer to Jesus' prayer? Will you live as an answer to Jesus' prayer? You know, when you give a, a woman a wedding ring, you know how it goes. 
Um, you place that ring on her finger, and she's so filled with joy. And you know, she's, <laughs> right? She's just like, you have to hold her hand because she, she's not wa- watching where she's going. She's like looking at her, she's looking at her ring, and her heart is filled with joy because of the glory of the ring. But she doesn't keep the glory to herself, right? I mean, she makes sure. Yeah, you know, I think, I think it's over there somewhere. Right? She's sharing the glory. She's sharing the glory of the wedding ring. She wants everyone else to see. And she, she has ways to display and, you know, and all that business. And, and I'm saying to you, the church, the church is like a wedding ring. The church is like a a wedding ring, and all these different aspects or facets are like diamonds set in the ring, how he keeps us and how he sanctifies us and how he unites us and how he loves us. And every local church is a, a wedding ring through which the glory of God is displayed to a lost world, beckoning them relentlessly, God beckoning them to come to him in faith. This is why we believe so strongly in planting churches. Planting churches where there is no Christian witness or where there's a failing Christian witness so that a community of lost people can see within the people of God the power of his glory and the depth of his love as he relentlessly reaches the lost through his people. You know, we've had the privilege in the last 10 years to plant or to be a part of planting over 40 churches. We've trained over 100 leaders to plant churches Um, or to be a part of a church planting team. And what we've seen is God demonstrate his radical glory through local church plants. And today what we are gonna do is we're launching our Awakened Church community today. And I wanna share with you the vision that we have for church planting in just a minute. But when we we changed uh, our name, We also, at the same time, created a community of churches. We're planting awakened churches. We're also planting churches that aren't awakened churches because we believe so strongly in advancing the kingdom of God. And when I say this, I'm not talking about a vision or a mission that leaders have. I'm talking about God's mission, God's purpose. And we all collectively together are part of that vision. (music) 